Writers everywhere fight autocrats and dictators with words. Books can reprogram you emotionally, changing your attitude uh, and making you partisan of certain idea or invulnerable to the state's propaganda. Worldwide, hundreds of writers are sitting in jail, subjected to persecution or living in exile. What do they fear about me? It's my words. Can they keep writing after being threatened or driven out of their country? Even I'm scared, I'm ready to say the things that I should say. It will not stop me. If I stop writing, then I die and I won't give them that pleasure of seeing me dead. Salman Rushdie also refuses to be silenced, despite almost being stabbed to death. The struggle goes on. Sometimes it's just a poem that angers powerful people. Or an interview or in the case of Salman Rushdie, a novel. The Satanic Verses was written as satire, but read by some as blasphemy, proof that writers live dangerously. We always get news of writers, fellow writers, friends, journalists from different countries uh, letting us know that they are at risk. Uh, the reason for this, I think the world is going uh, downslide. In many countries, the politics of uh, authoritarianism uh, getting popularity and the powers of freedom of expression are weakening. 813 writers from China, Iran, Malawi, Turkey and other countries are currently at risk, according to Writers Association Penn. Its Freedom to Write Index listed 311 writers in prison worldwide in 2022. Why do writers provoke such fear and hatred, especially in powerful people? And it's very strange because writers have no armies. You know. um, What's your explanation? I think they fear alternative versions of the world. You know, I think one, one of the things about authoritarian rule is it wants to impose its own version of the world to the exclusion of all others you know, and and um, and to, to make people afraid of of objecting to that you know, and and of course the point about writers is that everybody has all writers have their own version of the world you know, and and some and sometimes those don't please people in power and so they try to to, to silence them After decades of practice, I am a five-star general of writing. My deep scars from writing are medals of honor. We pack missiles in our pens and grenades in our mouths and shoot our troops at the dictatorship. Words are Stella Nianzi's weapons. And the poet and activist has no intention of keeping quiet. She's long been one of the most vocal critics of Uganda's President Museveni, who came to power in 1986 and rules the country with an iron fist. I'm a rebel. I like the word rebel. I refuse to be subdued and subjected and silenced. Uganda declared its independence in 1962. But is this East African country really free? Since 1986, it's been under Museveni's autocratic rule. Numerous laws hinder freedom of speech. Critics are intimidated, abducted, and imprisoned. Uganda recently made headlines for its tough new anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. According to these new laws, those deemed to be serial offenders could be punished with the death penalty. Uganda is one of the world's poorest countries. For years, Stella Nianzi has fought for the rights of marginalized groups, minorities, women, and the LGBTQ plus community but she's paid a high price for her activism. For almost two years, she's lived in exile in Germany, thousands of miles from her homeland. 
I'd had enough persecution. I'd had enough imprisonment. I'd had enough insults and threats and the constant trailing of my car, my children's car, the raids on my house. I had had enough persecution and accusation simply because I was criticizing the government, right? So I left because it was too dangerous for dissidents such as me to stay in Uganda. Why does she risk so much? Why does she keep writing angry poems about President Museveni and the Ugandan establishment, posting them online time and again? And I say I had a lot of anger because I lived in, in a country that just made me angry. I, I, I think I took on the pain of the people and it was my pain too, right? A hungry mother whose stomach is going grrr, grrr, and has three children whose stomachs are going grrr, grrr, cannot write a happy poem about food, <laughs> right? But it's not just anger that drives her. For Nianzi, reading and writing mean so much more. Writing invites you to come in and read. Words invite you to stop and listen, listen attentively. Did she say that? Did she write that? Why did you write that? Writing can get different responses. Let's think together. Argue with me. I'm persuading you, you're refusing, I'm persuading you. I'm engaging with your ideas, it's a dance. You know, it's swords, cha, cha, cha. Words that Museveni clearly considers dangerous. That's because Nianzi uses them to mobilize the masses and spur protests. After calling the president a pair of buttocks in a poem on Facebook, she was jailed for the first time. Though for her, it felt like a triumph. <laughs> There's a president in Africa, in a country called Uganda. A woman called him a pair of buttocks in a piece of writing on Facebook, not even published and he took her to jail. The whole world was laughing, ha, 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 and laughing at a very powerful man. A man in a country where people cannot laugh anymore because they fear him. So the power of writing to invite mockery and laughter from the masses. A few weeks later, Stella Nianzi was freed, only to be jailed again soon after. She spent 16 months in a maximum security prison in awful conditions. During that time, her children and other family members were threatened. The shame stays with you. So what is home when it's too dangerous for my loved ones and my family? Do I want to go back and become a danger? But why should home be dangerous? Because I write? For Stella Nianzi, living in exile doesn't mean keeping quiet or giving up. She plans to return to Uganda, perhaps once her children have grown up. She knows. The fight is not over yet. Words are the only victors. The attempt on Salman Rushdie's life in August 2022 took everyone by surprise. The fatwa issued against the writer 33 years before had largely been forgotten. So the world looked on in shock when Rushdie was stabbed with a knife and gravely injured at a public lecture. In 1989, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, claimed Rushdie had disparaged the prophet Muhammad in his novel, The Satanic Verses, and issued the fatwa, ordering Muslims to kill the writer. This triggered protests worldwide and the murder of the book's Japanese translator, Hitoshi Igarashi. Rushdie himself lost an eye and suffered severe injuries in the 2022 assassination attempt. A year later, Salman Rushdie was on tour and giving interviews. In Frankfurt, he was awarded the Peace Prize of the German book trade. Rushdie focused on his latest novel, Victory City. Finished before the attack on his life, it's the tale of an Indian kingdom in which all religions are permitted and women have more or less equal rights. The book can be read as a plea for freedom of speech, something Salman Rushdie himself has unwittingly come to symbolize. I don't feel like a symbol. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like a working writer. And, and uh, there are, I'm by no means the only writer in the world who has been threatened or attacked. You know? And um, unfortunately, this is a 
phenomenon that has gone on through history and it doesn't show any signs of stopping. So we have to fight against it. That's the only thing to do, keep to keep going. Who was there, apart from poets, who could break that vicious circle? Who was there left, apart from poets, who spoke in the language of death and who promised people the infinity of truth than the boundlessness of desire? Turkey also has a history of repression against authors, intellectuals, and journalists. Against those who question the party line and those who, like Salman Rushdie and Stella Nianzi, refuse to be intimidated. I was born and grew up in Turkey. And this is a place you cannot stay uh, outside the circle of politics because politics is not in certain places. It's in your daily life, in your street, in your house that brings your travels in your own country and other places. Burhan Sonmez is Kurdish. He was first arrested in 1984 after the Turkish military coup while still a student. Back then, the military threw half a million people in jail. Many were tortured. In 1996, Sonmez, then working as a human rights lawyer, was almost beaten to death by the police. He fled to Britain and started writing. His books have been translated into more than 40 languages, and he's now president of the Writers Association Pen International. Sonmez has since returned to Turkey and lives there on and off. He's witnessed the transformation of Erdogan firsthand, from promising prime minister in 2003 to today's autocratic president, someone who tolerates no opposition. Like in 2013, when demonstrations against a construction project in Istanbul's beloved Gezi Park spread to become nationwide protests. Erdogan brutally quashed them. And in 2016, a failed military coup led to mass arrests. Thousands of people were jailed for allegedly supporting the attempt, including many writers and journalists. They always lie, and also they use uh, unlawful pressure uh, against opposition groups, against intellectuals. That's not surprising. They are oppressing Kurdish um, people, uh, left-wing people, women, LGBT people, writers. The democracy means to accept the differences in a society and create a common sphere, you know, a public sphere for everyone. But the authoritarian regimes hate this idea. Sonmez's novel, Istanbul, Istanbul, speaks of the confines of jail and prisoners' boundless dreams, though it's not a political book. Still, Sonmez received death threats. President Erdogan's regime continues to feel threatened by writers. Do the writers feel scared too? Of course I'm scared. Um, even you are not scared for yourself, for your family, you know, for your loved ones. Uh, but on the other hand, um, in certain places, certain times, the fear is not the priority anymore. Because in Turkey, um, people, uh, I think, uh, cross that line. Uh, even I'm scared, I'm ready to say the things that I should say. It will not stop. Though it's an uneven fight, a whole regime against one writer with only words to defend him. What are you, Nicaragua, to cause me such pain? In Nicaragua, writers assumed power after the 1979 revolution. Sandinista rebels put an end to the Somoza family dictatorship and decades of civil war when they overthrew Anastasio Somoza de Valle. This revolution was supposed to bring about real change, end corruption, promote humane socialism and education for all. I think uh, some of the energy and the beauty of the revolution came from the fact that so many artists were involved in it. And so that's why, you know, people would come to Nicaragua and uh, admire what we were doing, the literacy campaign, for example. So we had that energy and that energy uh, make people fall in love with the revolution. Gioconda Belli, seen here with priest and poet Ernesto Cardinal, had already joined the Sandinista National Liberation Front in 1970. By then, she'd published her first poems and was living in exile when she was sentenced to a long jail term. 
Only after the Sandinista victory did she return to Nicaragua. It was a very hopeful time. Her 1988 novel, The Inhabited Woman, is based on her own experiences fighting with the revolutionaries, as well as being a tale of self-empowerment. It became a cult book for an entire generation. In the meantime, Daniel Ortega was elected president of Nicaragua. Writer Sergio Ramirez, seen here on the left, was his vice president. Poet and priest Ernesto Cardinal Martinez served as minister of culture. But that didn't bring peace to Nicaragua. The Contras, a right-wing rebel group, waged violent campaigns against the new leaders. In 1990, an anti-Sandinista coalition won the general election. The people were wary of war. Sixteen years and three failed attempts later, Ortega returned to power. Determined to hold on to it for himself and his wife and VP, Rosario Murillo. Gioconda Belli and other former comrades have long distanced themselves from him. We wanted more democracy within Sandinismo and we wanted to stop violence and we wanted to change and modernize the party. And he refused to do all of that. In 2018, Nicaraguans protested the president and his corrupt clan. The regime's response was brutal. Hundreds of people were killed and critics jailed. Under Ortega, the former freedom fighter, Nicaragua had become a dictatorship. The civilian ways are not allowed to happen. Right now in Nicaragua, we are not allowed to protest. We are not allowed to go into the streets. Even uh, religious processions have been forbidden because they are afraid of people going on the streets. They control everything. And so it's very hard for people to, to organize to change this. So I don't know what's going to happen. Since 2021, Gioconda Belli has lived in exile with her husband. Friends had advised her not to return home from a trip following a wave of arrests that sent countless regime critics to jail. Then things got even worse. In February 2023, Ortega's government stripped 300 opponents of the regime of their citizenship and confiscated their property. Belli was among them, along with fellow writer-in-exile Sergio Ramirez. It's like they tear apart your life, your memories, your, they, are, they are taking possession of the most intimate thing you have in life, which is the place where you have lived for many, many years. That's basically what, what they are doing. And I feel very devastated. Still, she has no intention of giving up. Belly keeps fighting because she still believes in the power of words, her words. I believe that words are powerful and um, the dictators are very afraid of a free speech. We have the word, we have a forum, we have people listen to us and, uh, and we have an international also access to tell the story of what's going on in Nicaragua. And, uh, and so they don't like that. Lord, what a splendid world we ruined. On the morning of February 24th, 2022, Dmitry Glukovsky realized nothing in his life would ever be the same. It was the day Russian troops invaded Ukraine, launching a war. I told myself, this moment of truth right now, uh, all the criticism that I've done before was, um, let's say, for free to me. I didn't have to pay any substantial cost. This time, the cost will be. Um, and I'm gonna probably never going to be able to go to go back to Russia, and uh, I'm probably going to lose whatever I own in there, and probably it's going to be something worse. It did indeed get worse, although Klukovsky immediately left Russia. He now lives in exile in Europe. The last year, they have declared me a foreign agent. Journalists have been declared foreign agents. And then the repressive 
legislation moves forward. That right now, they, they are warning that they're going to be um, hardening this legislation, making everyone who's spreading the message of foreign agents responsible for it. In August 2023, Glukowski was sentenced in absentia to eight years in a prison camp. In recent years, Russian President Vladimir Putin has had almost all opponents who are too great a threat to him imprisoned. The most prominent example is Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny, whose prison camp sentence has repeatedly been extended with new trials. Dmitry Glukowski is well known both in Russia and the rest of the world. His 2007 dystopian novel, Metro 2033, was a global bestseller. It's set in a future in which Moscow has been destroyed by a nuclear bomb, and the survivors live underground in a subway train tunnel. The book is now a cult classic and was the basis for several successful video games. Glukowski has also written two sequels. At first, Artyom, the main character, fights against mutants, but he's soon battling his own people. The conflicts involve old ideological rifts, communists versus Nazis. Klukowski calls the third volume of the series, Metro 2035, published in 2015, a political manifesto. Metro 2035 was written after Russia's uh, invasion of Crimea. And uh, following my observations of how the Russian society responded, it's in 2014 when Vladimir Putin invaded Crimea that uh, it's, it, the regime has started to um, create this this uh, propaganda machine that would convince Russians that there is an eternal war between Russia and the West, an existential war, that uh, the values of uh, the Russian people are completely contradictory to the rotten values of the West. Glukovsky was an early critic of Vladimir Putin, who was elected president of the Russian Federation in 2000, and is still in office today, interrupted by four years between 2008 and 2012, during which he was prime minister. Russia has become a dictatorship under Putin, says Glukovsky. Several wars against former Soviet republics took place during his term of office. As an author of dystopian novels, Glukovsky could remain under the radar for a long time, but in 2022, with the war in Ukraine, that all changed. Any public criticism of it, any anti-war demonstrations were all banned. But none of that stopped Glukovsky from protesting against the Russian invasion of Ukraine in interviews and his social media accounts. He says the state can ban the sale of his books, but not their distribution on social networks. You can just spread your messages, your, your books, your stories, your novels on online media for free without any need of approval or support from the state. Glukovsky is skeptical that Russian society will defend itself against repression by Putin's power structures. His hope lies in the younger generation, which has little interest in the older generation's fantasies of world domination. What's very important to me that I have seen with my own eyes um, the, the birth of a generation that was completely um, I would say globalized, very friendly towards the West, very open to integrating and accepting the global values. Dmitry Glukovsky believes that there will only be hope for Russia when the old men are no longer in power. Dictators try to intimidate writers through brute force and persecution, but Penn International's president believes they won't emerge victorious. Despite all this oppression from governments, from authoritarian regimes, I think the power of uh, writers not been broken. We are still stronger, and I think uh, we will prevail. And all the attempts to modernize Russian societies, society have, have always been inspired by the European political and social culture. And... Uh, I definitely do believe that it's where Russia, Russia's future ultimately lies. What writers can do, which they are doing, is to try and articulate the incredible pain that many people are feeling right now, you know, and, and, uh, and to bring that to the world's attention. You know? And I, I, think, I think writers everywhere are doing that right now. 
my words will remain even when I die, <laughs> you know. When I was in prison, I wrote on the walls. I was in solitary confinement. They had handcuffed me and I was naked. And I thought, how dare these people? So I used the handcuffs to write on the walls of that solitary confinement prison. My dreams are, you know, to go back and go back to a country that is free, that where these tyrants are no longer in power and where we are able to begin the reconstruction and create a system that is respectful of human rights. These writers won't let anyone destroy their dreams and their words are here to stay. No wonder they strike fear in the hearts of dictators. But despots come and go. Words and thoughts live on. Do you know other writers whose lives are at risk? Ones whose works are must-reads? Tell us all about them in the comments.